Let's begin with prayer now that everybody's here. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, great poet of all poets, thank you for giving us the gift of language so that we can read and understand in different forms your word. And thank you for the gift of poetry through which your word can be reinforced or eliminated <coughs> or illustrated or verified. And thank you for this class that means so much to me and I think to each of us as we grow closer to you through your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, now a little, a, little, uh, for, a little backing up here. Last week we were just blown away because you didn't know this was Doug's grandfather. We started off with 1 Corinthians 13 with love. And actually we ended with love too. But the poems that Doug's grandfather wrote just so illustrate it, love bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It, you know, I mean, we were, and then we ended with baggy pants, and I do have a handout for you. What I read to you last week, and what was up here, um, I, I typed because it was only up there, and I thought, no, we need, we need this little poem. Love wins. Um, this for you who weren't here, I'll do it really quickly. Um, hold up, baggy pants, would you? Doug brought it in. Do you have baggy pants? Who has baggy? Hey, Florence, woo! Somebody hold up baggy pants. Oh, yes, that's the book. Yeah. And, and that. Baggy pants. Yeah. And the first story is Baggy Pants, which was published in uh, Reader's Digest in 1956. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, yeah 1956. When I was a senior in high school. Granddaddy was so excited. Somebody paid attention to what he wrote. <laughs> so and then uh, it was published. But, uh, this is a collection of stories, things that are wrote. You read the other ones, and you'll realize, I mean, there's some just fun things in here, but a lot of the other stuff are very different than what comes out of the pain of being a prisoner. And Doug was kind enough. You remember a couple of weeks ago, he asked me why do people write poetry? And when I found if, I said, here's the answer. Here's the answer. And you remember if in that handout. He could just put in meter and rhyme all these images that have been in his brain for uh, uh, what he's seen in the prison camps. And if he could just put on paper in meter and rhyme how um, they felt, the prisoners felt. And so he did. But, so I. Tell Doug this, and then Doug one-ups me and brings me, he made me a copy of Baggy Pants, where his grandfather in Baggy Pants, in prose, tells why he wrote that. And I read that to you last week, uh, but I thought, you know what, reading is one thing, and half the time things don't get on the, um, because maybe they can't hear me, because I'm wandering around. But, um, <laughs> like, well, here is um, what this is, and I started this hand out with what has almost been my mantra that you hear over and over, that uh, poems are not words after all, but fires for the cold, ropes let down for the loss, and something that's necessary is bread for the hungry. And I always thought of that as my being a recipient of poetry. I never thought of it as someone writing poetry, but the act of writing poetry for Doug's grandfather was a rope for him. It was fire for him. It was bread. So um, I won't. We won't read this. But this is what I read to you last week, and then here is um, Love Wins, which is. Um, what was up here on the screen. So that, you know, just take home and read that and digest that, just add that to your, your files. If I get one? Okay, just one. This time I'm gonna hand out hand, I'm gonna hand out handouts one at a time so we don't get confused. Okay. All right, thank you. All right. So, there it is. In prose. The very same thing that is in poetic, poetic form in if. Very same thing. All right, now, what I didn't tell you, because it was not my story to tell, 
and it's Dee's story, and Dee was not here on doctor's orders. But there is also a little, let me back up here, um, this kind of a neat thing to, uh, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, D, we talked about um, Doug's grandfather being a POW for three and a half years, and one of the um, books he wrote was South to Batahan. Doug told me it's not Bataan. I was yeah, like, it's Bataan. Why were the Filipinos put two A's in there? Well, and I don't know. It's Bataan. Okay. Because it ain't Bataan, it's Batahan. But, that no, that people call it. but Americans call it Bataan. That's what yeah. I had always I thought. supposed to be so we would have. Huh? How is it supposed to be said? Everybody in the world says Bataan unless you're in Batahan. But anyway, Bataan to us, or Bataan, D, you want to add what um, for the class? Because last week was so good. Tell them your connection with this. Well, the connection was my father was also on the Bataan death march with Doug's grandfather. How about that? Yeah. The exception is he had walked the death march and granddaddy was, as a general, was taken on a truck with the other senior officers. Mm -hmm. The really interesting thing to me to find out is that his father, of course I didn't know him, and she, <laughs> this only comes out later when I'm, we're getting married, but he was a, probably a captain in the army assigned to the Philippines, and the officer that he reported in for duty to was my grandfather. Well, I mean, is that scary? <laughs> wow. I mean, what a great God who can weave threads like that together. So, thank you. But, uh, indeed, it was better. That's, that's your story to tell, but thank you. I'm glad you're here. Okay, now a little poetry, because you know from time to time we said it the first. I, I would, uh, all right, what do we think this is? Okay, that we would work in from time to time some of the elements of poetry. So we've done uh, meter, we've done rhyme, we've done the sonnet form, we've done the definitions of blank verse and all of that. On the back of that first handout sheet should be Yes, figurative language. You've, you've heard, uh, oh, he was speaking metaphor, metaphorically, or I'm speaking figuratively. There's really sort of two kinds of languages, metaphorical or figurative and literal. Literal language means it means what it says. With uh, um, the figurative language, and poets use it a lot, uh, it's, it's language that's not intended to be literal, but it serves to enrich and enlarge. Um, a literal meaning. And there are more figures of speech than just listed here, but these are the primary ones that you'll see often. A simile, I know you know this from high school English, it's the comparison of unlike objects using like or as. So I like a usurped town. You remember that from John Donne? Batter my heart, three person God. You know, I am betrothed to your enemy. And thou like adamant draw mine iron heart, again from one of Don's summits. The metaphor is, again, it's a comparison, but it's an implied comparison, and it doesn't use um, like or as. So, um, and here I'm borrowing from, um, from Doug's grandfather. If I could dress these tattered waifs of mine in lingual costumes, now the tattered waves so are these ideas in his brain that are just not dressed up enough yet for primetime poetry in lingual costume. I mean, what a, what a, he's not mixing his metaphors there, which is really good. Um, he's dressing them in lingual costume, nice. Personification, giving human qualities to non-human objects, concepts, or things, fearing the chronic angers of that house, We'll read this poem tonight, maybe. 
Uh, but then from 1 Corinthians, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. You know, people boast. People are arrogant. People are patient. People are kind. Um, and you'll see a lot of personification, especially in the Psalms. Uh, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Righteousness and truth have kissed each other. You'll see a lot of personification there. Hyperbole, exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. I'm so hungry I could eat a bear. Well, probably not, but you're, you're hungry. Metonymy is a cool one where something very closely associated with the thing is used to stand for or suggest or represent the thing itself. So if Johnny Block has, comes home with a brand new car and I say, that's a nice set of wheels, um, that's metonymy, where there's, you know, wheels are associated with that car. Um, or our graduations hang on the wall. Does anybody remember that old song? And our graduations hang on the wall. Remember it? I mean, not y'all, you're too young. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna Google it because it's, it's in my mind for some reason, but partly that's because I taught high school and there are so many things I you know, heard. Okay, I'm, but I'm gonna find what that is. Um, and then illusion. We're going to see some allusions. As a matter of fact, you already did see some allusions. Uh, a reference to a person or things or historical events, uh, references to literature, references to the Bible. Here's what's neat, and y'all are going to be included in all this. Uh, allusions imply that you have some sort of knowledge, some sort of reading, some sort of cultural experience that's shared by um, you know, a, a, common, a common us. And it used to be, when I was growing up, and um, sadly I'm not so sure that it's in the curriculum anymore, but there was a sense of that education should transmit the Western cultural heritage. So there was a whole body of things that we knew, that we knew because that's what we grew up with. And um, some of that is being lost, and, um, which is more the pity, but anyway. So it, it functions kind of as, as shorthand whereby the recalling of the something outside the work supplies an emotional or intellectual <coughs> context. You saw that in General Brower's poem, when soldiers drink the bitter cup, the wives must drink it too. The bitter cup. Now, the pleasure of teaching y'all is that I don't have to stand up here and explain to you about the bitter cup. Um, I remember being astounded when I realized that my worldview, and we're going to talk about that, the one I grew up with was not the same out there in the general culture. It was um, probably in 1966, I think. And um, I was teaching a Hawthorne story, and I said to the class, now this is an allusion to Pontius Pilate. What? An allusion to Pontius Pilate. And more than half the class didn't know who Pontius Pilate was. Uh, it's, yeah, in 66. And this was a Christian school? No, public, oh, okay. public school. Big public school. Big public school. Anyway. And then uh, in the Browning poem, speak to me as to Mary at thy feet. Well, I didn't need to tell you the whole thing. That's, but anyway, so you have seen allusions already in the poems that we've had heretofore. I just haven't pointed them out to you. Uh, but I bet you caught them anyway. I bet. Right? All right. All right. No, yes. The graduation hang on the wall. Yeah. It's from one of my favorite songs, Allentown. 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 Thank you. Familiar. And our graduations hang on the wall, right? The village really help us at all. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Allentown. That's <laughs> what says. So the graduations hang on the wall, but they never really help us at all. In other words, their diplomas are on the wall. Okay, I had to know, I had to know um, current songs because sometimes that's the only way you can talk to the kids. I mean, they'll get it if you say, this is, so, yeah. There's so much useless stuff that rattles around in my brain that's really awful. Ask Johnny, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, now from the first handout of last week, where, and it starts with uh, 1 Corinthians, so go in your notebooks and find that first handout, because on the back of that, and 
um, are two poems we didn't get to because I really wanted to cover um, this before. And I am so sorry that I don't have an extra one, but you want to look on with. Okay, find the handout that says, um, well, it's from last week. get on to the next pages and not have to go, okay, now go back, people, three pages and find this handout that I gave you last week. Um, okay, you got that handout with, okay. Abu bin Adem, great poem, and it's easy to memorize, it's fun to memorize, and you can almost tell it as a story. Do you still remember it? No? No, no one remembers. Do you? Harold, do you, could you still say, I should put you on the spot, could you still say Abu Ben Adam? And saw, okay, and saw within the moonlight of his room, making it rich and like a lily in bloom, an angel writing in a book of gold, right? Anyway. Who wants to read that for me? Because, or you want me to read it? I'll read it, because I have fun reading. Abu bin Adam, may his tribe increase, awoke one night from a deep dream of peace, and saw within the moonlight of his room, making it rich and like a lily in bloom, an angel writing in a book of gold. Exceeding peace had made Ben Adam bold, and to the presence in the room he said, what writest thou? The vision raised its head, and with a look made of all sweet accord, answered the names of those who love the Lord. And is mine one? said Abu. Nay, not so, replied the angel. Abu spoke more low, but cheerily still, and said, I pray thee then, write me as one that loves his fellow men. The angel wrote and vanished. The next night it came again with a great wakening light and showed the names whom love of God had blessed. And lo, then Adam's name led all the rest. Good point. Good point. Um, Lee uh, Hunt was, he's British, dates are up there. He lived, uh, he's, he's lumped in with the Romantic poets, but he was never one of the, the great Romantic poets. You know, we think of Wordsworth and Coleridge, Shelley, Keats, uh, Byron. Uh, he never was quite that good. He was, though, a literary critic. He was editor of a, of a, a little weekly newspaper called The Guardian, and he published a lot of um, Shelley and Keats' first poems uh, in The Guardian, and so a lot of Oh, if you look online again, you will say he introduced Shelley and Keats to the, to the public. But he, he wanted to write poetry, but he never was um, quite, he, and he knew he wasn't as good as they were anyway. But anyway, British, um, and Abu Ben Adam really was a, a, a person. Um, he was um, an ascetic Sufi saint. Sufi is kind of, a, it's a branch of sort of mystic Muslim. Those are the Sufis. And uh, he lived seven, about, they think, 718 to 782. And there are actually some mosques in the United States named for him. You probably know that. So anyway, but now, back to this poem. It's interesting. Abu bin Adam made his tribe increase and woke one night from a deep dream of peace and saw within the moonlight of his room 
making it rich and like a lily in bloom. An angel writing in a book of gold. Why a lily? The poet could have said a rose in bloom. He could have said a daisy in bloom. He could have said chrysanthemums in bloom. What, what does he gain here? Because you know, we poets can use any words they want. Making it rich and like a lily in bloom. There's surely the two L's. The two L's together are kind of a. Yeah, yeah that's, oh, that's not, yeah, you got the, the L's in lily and then the L in bloom. So it's alliterative, that's one thing. Well, another thing is that birds and women symbols you see, I mean, does that have anything to do with Yeah, isn't that interesting that this is a poem about a Sufi mystic <coughs> and yet this. Christian writer is using the lily, which is a Christian symbol. Mm -hmm. And you, you know our, our mealers with the fleur de lis? Mm -hmm. Do you know what fleur de lis means in French? Mm -hmm. The flower of the lily? Mm -hmm. With those three, um, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. So um, I really like this. Um, what is, what would you say the theme, the message of this poem is? Yes, and you if you love your fellow man, shows that you really love God. Absolutely, you love your fellow man. You love God. You have loved what God has created. You've loved your fellow man. Absolutely. You love what God loves. Hmm? You love what God loves. Yes, you love what God loves. Oh man, I'm having a moment where I can't remember anything. Um, screw tape letters. C.S. Lewis. Lewis, Mere Christianity, wrote that. Um, was talking about people's dispositions and on a spectrum you could have someone who maybe is Buddhist or Muslim or whatever and someone who is a Christian but is closer to God you know in these other mm -hmm. non you know Christian centered religions than the Christian and it could take just one thing one realization one turning of perception and you know, there they are. Um, uh, right, right. Because they're God's children too. Right. They're God's creation too. As opposed to someone who has been in the church and, and claims to be a Christian and walks around grumbling and angry and, you know, self-turned and just full of venom and right. whatever. Right, right, right. Can I be a heretic? <laughs> Sure. Oh, only this one. There's nobody <laughs> in here with a collar. So yes. yes, be a heretic. Uh, this is a this is a very nice poem, but uh, the writer has no clue as to what a, a Muslim Sufi saint really thinks and believes. But it's nice. Right, it's and, nice. And, and people have actually didn't. The difference, I'll say, is the poems like my grandfather wrote, he knew absolutely what he was talking about. Sure he did. And this is just a nice poem. Th this is a nice poem. It's not up there with the great ones and at, at all. Um, but under the theme of love and in trying to give you all, yes. I'll go before I live and die. I would suggest the poet, I don't know at all, is being somewhat heretical in the message. Sure. Arguably, uh, love the Lord Jesus, the relationship with the Lord Jesus is not necessary to be in, in God's favor. Right. Uh, and of course, uh, Islam does not have Jesus as part of its faith uh, in us at all. And so he's kind of saying that's okay. Islam is, is just as good as Christianity. <coughs> but I mean, that's one way to interpret, and I don't know any of his background. Uh, no, well, he's British. He, um, uh, no, he wasn't. We're going to get into worldview in, in a little bit, and that will explain so much about. I mean, when we were doing Herbert and Dunn, I mean, that's just a no way. They are obviously Christians, and they are obviously writing from, uh, you know, and, but we're going to see some that, um, that, that aren't. And yet, 
there can be a certain amount of truth in almost, you know, in almost anything that women will read, because Andrew has vetted them all. And um, Andrew, you know, Andrew and Morgan had uh, read this poem, and they both liked it. They both liked it a lot. And so, um, yeah. And I told him, I will defer to you. As a matter of fact, he read one, and he, he read it so beautifully. We'll get to that down the line. And he said, you know, this is um, heretical. You know this really isn't the view that we have. And I said, I know, but it's the view of, you'll see it like on this one, but it's the, it represents the simple, simple view of somebody who's a, a simple, simple thing. You know, who's not versed in theology, who doesn't know anything about but, okay, but with, um, underline the last line, write me as one that loves his fellow men. Hunt wanted that, and it is, as his epitaph. That's on his gravestone. Write me as one that loves his, mellow, has his fellow men. Um, that's his epitaph. He chose it. So, that's. On his gravestone? On Hunt's. His, Lee Hunt's. On his, on his, Hunt's. Yeah. But you can't, I mean, there, I'll tell you about these romantic poets, and, and probably all of you took a course on, on, in romanticism maybe in college. They came so close to knowing what the real truth is, but they miss it. They miss it. They're either all thinking, you know, pantheism or their, but, um, mm -hmm. and yet some of the things that they write, you would just say, if you would take one step further, you would, would be there. And see, that's what, whereas I can definitely see if you take this just completely on the words, sometimes, this is just my way of thinking, poetry is as much about what is written sometimes as it is about what is not or yeah. what is implied. Yeah. And it's that in the waking hours of between those dreams, you know, what that's the implication that you're given is that maybe there was a step further taken. Right. Perhaps that corner was turned. Mm hmm Yeah. Just remember that Jesus and the centurion came to him and People said, you know, this man is very good. He helps many of the people. And, and Jesus responded to his request. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he may not be this far, but he's not over here. He's here. Right, right. And, you know, we're all works in progress, of course. And in The Great Divorce, you know what C.S. Lewis maintains in The Great Divorce, that there, that there is a progression... It, the fancy term is sanctification after death. Well, do you think I didn't have Andrew, Father Andrew, in here that night? Because I'm not answering questions about sanctification on death. No. <laughs> you know, I'm an English teacher. I'm not a theologian. I did not go to Duke. But, um, and so if we have some really heavy questions, we'll get Father Andrew up here. We'll get the brain, you know. Okay, so are we good on that? It's a nice little poem. It has meter. It has rhyme. It has a. It's just a happy little poem, you know. If especially if you're not, you know, nice little poem. Okay. Well, so. I like it because there are a lot of people, other names I can plug in there, and then I started thinking about, okay, who does this personify? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, uh, John Newton, William Wilberforce. We just keep going. Yeah. 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 You know, and because, and you know, the reason probably that he chose Abu Ben Adam when he could have chosen anybody else to write about, is that he was writing in the Romantic age, and you know, the Romantic poets were really, you know, okay. So that's kind of romantic. All righty. Um, now then, we're going to get three more on love, and one of them is still on that first handout, and it's called Those Winter Sundays, and it's by the middle guy there, Robert Hayden. Uh, he's an American. He, for a while, was U.S. Poet Laureate. Um, we'll see free verse for the first time. 
um, free verse, and I didn't give you a handout on that because you probably know what it is. It, it's free of meter and rhyme. It's um, it's poetry that has no set metrical pattern and no set rhyme pattern, and yet you'll see how a poet can tie together or structure a poem so that um, it, it does have some kind of coherence to it. Um, this poem, uh, this poem breaks my heart in a way. Okay, this is, so this is Robert Hayden, and we're still, now we're still on the back page of the handout from last week, right below Abu Ben Adam. Okay, and then we'll be, then we'll be good with this page. Okay, everybody here? All right. Those winter Sundays. Got it? Yeah. Okay. Question? Got it. Okay. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold, then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well, what did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Well, that made me cry. I, I, I it, you know, I told you sometimes it's all I can do to keep from. Um, this makes me cry too, and um, it makes us ashamed some way that we were so ignorant. Sure. It, it, let's go back to those original questions. Who's the speaker, and what's the occasion? The speaker of this poem is who's, who's the speaker? Yeah, and the occasion is it? Huh? I just say young Bob. <laughs> young Bob, is he young now or is he old? No, right. Right. He's looking back to when he was a young kid. Um, ah, there's so much in this. Yes. I got a technical question. Okay. Technical. Since there's no rhyme or meter, what makes this poetry and not prose? Well, um, first of all, there's a lot of um, kind of, well, let's, if, to, next week I'm going to write this out in, in like sentence form for you. But what makes it a poem, I think, is that it's just a crystallized moment. It's an experience that you see the, let's look at the way it's structured with these, with these um, um, stanzas and watch how he's going to tie the stanzas together and he's going to tie lines together um, and, which is one thing that poets do, they use so much repetition that um, it'll tie it together look in the second line uh, blue black blue black cold and then look at the cracked hands can you hear the, the the linking together of blue black and cracked hands his hands weren't they were so cold they were blue black it's so cold in that house from labor in the weekday weather well, that ached from labor, labor in the weekday weather that made and he made banked fires blaze no one ever thanked him and then there's that pause, and you, you think about that, and you, you have the picture here. If this were prose, we wouldn't be stopping to pause at every, at every um, stanza. Isn't there, isn't there a rhythm within that, even though it may not be a rhythm that you can necessarily count? And there's also the use of punctuation. And in prose, at least for me, yeah, in prose, you, would, you wouldn't say splintering, comma, breaking. That brings that pausing. You would say splintering and breaking. Yeah. And you would also say... I would rise and dress. I feared the crime, and, and it's it's the use of to me is what makes the difference in that is you do have some rhythm that's within the punctuation, within the way it's formatted as well that lends itself that way. So just reading it as a prose description of, of the same event. It, right. Well, a poem makes a poem makes you feel, and uh, the poem makes you 
feel yeah. more than prose, and then when prose uh, gets to the point of uh, expressing something in a way that makes you have feelings, uh, uh, often you say that's almost poetic. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, prose is meant really to communicate uh, facts in a literal way. And, uh, and poetry wants to communicate the experience uh, in, in a way that... While there are facts in this yeah. information, it's not written in a fact-based manner. Right. It's written more in a, you're looking into the idea or the memory. Yeah. It's giving you a visualization of the memory. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, the fact of if you were to put this in a in a in prose, you'd say. Um, you say my father got up early every Sunday as well, and then he got dressed and he did this and he made the fire, and then I woke and I did. And then you would eventually say, it, and I was I never showed gratitude and I never understood why until much much later. Yeah. And, yeah. Really, wow. and that strange. and that would and it's it's very much it's the, it's the recitation more so. And, and prose can have a, obviously has a beauty to it when it's well written, uh, but again, it is an expression that, that it's almost a, a, a shorthand to me with the rhythm, with the way it's formatted, more so than you would with prose. Well, and I'll go back to Doug's grandfather's poem, If, now that you have in written form the prose, both the prose in Baggy Pants and the poem If say the same thing. He wanted to get this written down. But whereas the prose, the prose, it's powerful, but it doesn't translate into the emotion that, yeah, that the poem, if it does. Yeah. The, the writer, the poet, mm -hmm. is helping the reader to be able to read. Just as those who translated the Hebrew Bible to and gave us the Psalms. They were not written in that format. Those who translated and gave us the, the Psalms, which are, think yeah. of it, they look like this. They're formatted like this. Formatted like yeah. this have given, given us the same thing. Yeah. And, and if we just read the Psalms, one long prose line, it just wouldn't be the same. No, it, it's not. It, those, the breaks make you pause, they make you think, they, they set off the idea isolated, you know, by itself. The, um, and I don't know if you noticed too, but the word cold uh, repeats in every stanza. It's, cold is in the first stanza. Uh, uh, no, it's not. It's in the last stanza. No, yes, yeah, in the second stanza, first line, cold, splintering. And then it's in the last stanza, who had driven out the cold. So cold, cold, cold. It's cold. It's cold. His hands are blue-black from the cold. Um, they're, they're cracked from working outside in the cold. Um, I just, I th go ahead. I agree with the judge, because there's, there's no doubt this is poetry, but <clears throat> the, the being able to feel cold when you say blue-black, I, I know that cold, we we'll probably all do, and in parts about, about the splintering, the fire, and it makes you, you can, you can smell the oak burning in the fireplace. Yes. And, the only, the only thing that I'm not sure of is the fear and the chronic anguish of the house. I think that to mean a boy who was probably growing up, he, he would have been a young boy during World War One. So, you know, it's, it's pretty hard times. And uh, I could see the house at that point with dad being up <coughs> Sunday mornings, dark, yeah. you know, and cold. The house has been chilled all night. And now as it's starting to warm, it's Wood floor is popping and crackling, and it's got to be scarier for a five or six year old kid to hear like yeah. those noises every morning. Yeah. You know. When I first read the poem, I saw chronic anger is, is an interesting uh, uh, figure to the device because a house can't be angry, no. um, and it's a chronic, it's a chronic anger. 
I, I thought maybe because like, uh, probably all of y'all can remember what my dad used to turn down the phone and stuff to 55 degrees. Maybe because he, he had delusions of penury. But anyway, um, but you could hear the boards as they warmed up. They would, they would crack, they would make noise. But when you read about uh, Robert Hayden, he uh, was adopted by a foster family that lived next door to, to his biological parents because his biological parents were fighting all the time. They couldn't agree. They wanted to give him away, so they gave him away to the people next door. He was not born Hayden. He adopted that name by his foster parents. But the foster parents used to fight all the time. The dad apparently was a, was a this dad. But the dad and his wife were always fighting. The, the, the foster mother used to beat him regularly. The father would intercede. Um, and, and there were chronic angers in that house due to the, the parents, the, the mother and the father, who were always fighting. That just added another dimension to it. Um, and you know, he was probably keeping his head so low, just flying under the radar. Uh, keep it low, speaking indifferently to him. He was probably too scared to say much of anything to anybody. Yeah. Speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. See, that's the dichotomy that so many of us have known or experienced at some point in life, and it is the knowing someone who is both holy, good, and bad, and seeing both parts of that, mm -hmm. and not knowing which which version you're going to get. Yeah. Um, and, and feeling the, the remorse yeah. of not being able to reconcile that. Yeah. And I, I, I just read into it and get into what you said. There's a remorse to a sense that, that obviously the father expressed, he did not know how to, in a sense, properly express yeah. love. And obviously with the actual relationship with that, he expressed it by the things he did, and, it's, and, he, and obviously there were difficulties. And I think I, I read this, and again, my interpretation. He appears to be looking back and saying, "Yeah, we have our difficulties," and I went through. But he looked out after me. Right. He showed his love in a way that I didn't understand, yeah. and in a sense was wrong because he, you know, and knowing the other facts there yeah. too. But he did. He he cared for me. He made sure I didn't have to deal with certain things. You know, even though he, even though he failed in other ways. Yeah. So, my guess is he wrote it after his father yeah, died. Uh, uh, he did. He did. Any, he, he did. And maybe we're reading into it without any chance of any reconciliation either. And that's why I, I, I kind of think it's thanks to each other. Yeah, uh, two things, and I hope I can remember both of them. One, to your point, I mean, we're gonna, we, we have somewhere, we'll just see what week it's going to be, uh, a thematic unit on work, where work is the theme, and I've got several work poems. Um, that are interesting, but one of them is from the prophet uh, on work, and the line that I always remember is, work is love made visible. Mm -hmm. And I have thought about that so many times with Johnny. Um, work is love made visible. I think all of you who know somebody who's, yeah, work is love made visible. Matter of fact, Johnny, I might even get Father Andrew to say that years from now. Um, anyway, um, work is love made visible. Now, second, how many of us, though, even though we might not have grown up, and I certainly didn't, I did not grow up in a house with chronic angers, but I certainly didn't thank my father for all that he did for me. I certainly did not thank my mother. You know, I, I might have maybe to be polite or something, but not, but it was probably a superficial thing. I, I, we just, we're just kids. You know, and, but he's having a hard time. Notice that repetition of, what did I know? He doesn't say it once. He says it twice. What did I know? What did I know? You know, he, he was just a kid of love's austere and lonely offices. Lovely alliteration there, isn't it? You hear that? Of lonely and uh, love's lonely, those three L's. Um, and you hear the S's, too, of love's austere and lonely offices. You hear those S's and the L's. And um, there's, just, there's just poetic, a lot of poetic techniques in this, even though it doesn't have a set metrical pattern 
or set rhyme. Now, you might like Robert Frost, who defines, who defines free verse as playing tennis with the nets down. <laughs> he thinks, you know, anybody can do it. Okay, um, another term, and we, we've seen it, um, and we'll see it some more, is enjambment, E-N-J-A-M-B-M-E-N-T. Do you know that term? It's when the, um, it's when the, the, the thought doesn't end with the line, but it runs on into the next line. And that's, some of those are called run-on lines, but uh, enjambment is the fancy name for that. And you see that here, um, especially with um, that aches from labor in the weekday, it, it, labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. You know, you, you can see lots of that. Um, Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. And then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. How many of you hear those long A's in that one stanza? You know, we talked about all the techniques that, of repetition that a poet will use to link something together. You've got a blue-black, cracked, ached, labor, made, blaze, hear all those. So um, anyway, is it getting hot in here to y'all? If anybody who's hot, the, it's back there. We want to get, hot get it colder. Hot. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, you were talking about the yeah. generation of love and lonely, but even though those words are spelled differently, they still have an awe sound. Yeah. You know, the opposites and you know, spirit and opposites. Good for you, because that definition that we had weeks ago was not the repetition, this is vowels with the assonance, it's not the repetition of vowels, it's the repetition of vowel sounds. Good. Y'all are all getting A's. We're having a midterm tomorrow. <laughs> Y'all are all getting A's. All right. So let me see, let me see. Um, I, no matter what I do, we're going to start, I want you to know about worldview. Because what we're going to do, and we won't have time to do both of them tonight, unfortunately, but we're going to get a start. There are two poems on love, or the theme is love. One is written by Shakespeare, who lived, if it's 1564 to 1616 are his dates, he was clearly there with the King James Bible and John Donne and Robert, Herb I mean, George Herbert and um, the Book of Common Prayer in the 1500s one worldview, and the other is going to be Matthew Arnold. But I want you to get, most of you probably know what the term worldview is. I didn't hear it until I was in my 40s. Uh, just didn't, never heard of it before. But um, a worldview is, is your mental view of reality. And we have in this country a lot of worldviews. All over the world we have a lot of worldviews too. Um, some people define it as a comprehensive framework of ideas and attitudes about the world, ourselves, and life. A worldview can pervade a culture so thoroughly it becomes a culture's concept of reality. And, uh, and that's kind of neat. We don't live in such a culture. Within our church group we do, but not the, the worldwide, you know, not even the nationwide culture. Um, Walker Percy, um, good writer, says, I do not conceive it my vocation to preach the Christian faith in a novel. By the way, Walker Percy is a devout Christian. But as it happens, my worldview is informed by a certain belief about man's nature and destiny, which cannot fail to be central to any novel I write. And so uh, you will see worldview pervading just can't help it, the, the writings of a lot of these people. And we're going to start with da -da 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 -da, two errors, two different views of love. Okay, two worldviews, two different views of love. William Shakespeare and Matthew Arnold. And we won't, we might get, well, we'll see. We'll see. Okay, now. Beach. I've got something for y'all next week. Lawrence is in it. 
because she thought my PowerPoint this morning, y'all have to come next Thursday. Because you're going to get a treat. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, everybody got one? We should have. Okay. You should have two errors, two different views of love. William Shakespeare. Okay, who else? Everybody got one? Yeah. All right. Yeah. William Shakespeare. Clearly, as you know from the handouts before, right there, you know what his worldview is. You know this sonnet, too. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh, no. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Now, this sonnet, look at that second word in the second line, impediments. How many of you have heard that word before Catherine Trock was married, used in church when the bands of marriage were announced? Who was paying attention? All right. And what, what was read? What did they say? If any of you know any impediments. impediments. This is clearly, I mean, Shakespeare didn't just get this word out of, out of air. He was, this was in his culture. He heard this word. It was, um, okay. And look down at the bottom. Uh, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. What scripture do you see so clearly in there? Love bears. All things. bears. You remember 1 Corinthians 13? It bears all <coughs> things, hopes all things, endures all things. And what about the edge of doom? How is that a... What about doomsday? In, in, the, uh, in Shakespeare's time, that referred to the second coming of Christ, when, it, it, I mean, we think of doomsday as doomsday, you know, the bomb's going to drop on us, yeah, but, um, but here it means when, when Christ has come to judge the world, and, you know, the love is going to last that long, that long, it's, it's, um, this is so clearly, when you look back to that first handout with, um, um, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, about what love is. This is as he's saying that folks, I, I can't tell who he's talking to, but what he's saying is, let's say he's talking to a friend. He's talking to his muse. He's talking to his muse. Yes. <laughs> um, what's he saying here? He's saying, you know what? There's a lot more to love than just uh, the way you feel. There's a lot more going on here than just the way you feel. Your love is not love which alters when an alteration finds. Well, hello, I've gained 30 pounds since we got married. Thank goodness Johnny loves me just the same. Or, um, you know, hello, one of us is limping around the house and not doing so hot and spry. And, but love doesn't alter when an alteration finds. Or there's no reason. If you love, if you truly love somebody, you're not going to try to change them, fix them up, alter them. That's not what true love is. Or bends with the remover to remove. Nah, nah. You are straight. Oh, no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. Love is steady. Love is constant. Tr this... He is talking about as nearly as a human being can come to godly love. This is it in this sonnet. 
as, as nearly as a human being can come to the way God loves us. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, though his height be taken. Uh, the star, what's, the, what's a wandering bark? A ship. A ship, who said that? Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, you are absolutely right. It's metonymy. Uh, that's not really bark, but it's closely associated. You know, ships used to, okay. Love it, I don't have to explain a lot to y'all. Um, love is not time's fool. Yep. Though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Yeah, we're going to lose the bloom on our... The, the, the bloom is going to fade from the rose. T that is subject to time, but not love. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ nor no man ever loved. There's a marvelous little book that I would recommend to you. I meant to bring it in, but I forgot to. Uh, it's called To Love as God Loves. Has anybody ever read it? It's um, by Roberta Bondi. And I first heard about it years ago in a sermon when a bishop had come down from um, Atlanta to our little church, and he was talking about this. But in this little book, and I'll never forget what he said, because then I bought the book and I read, and yeah, that's exactly what he said that um, love, in, in To Love As God Loves, he defines love as a conscious and cultivated long-term commitment of the heart that has less to do with how you feel and everything to do with how you act and what you believe. Wow. That love is a conscious and cultivated long-term commitment of the heart that has more to do, that has less to do with how you feel and everything to do with how you behave and what you believe. And that's the same kind of thing. That it is, and this is godly love, as close as a human being can get to it. And yes. Huh? Oh, Roberta Bondi, R O B E R T A B O N D I. And I've got a copy if you can't find it. Okay. Okay, I have a kind of a technical question about line three of the sonnet, which offers when it alteration finds. He's intentionally reversing the sentence structure. Mm -hmm. Subject, object, verb. Is that is that a a technique, like uh, some of the yeah. we talked about. In order to, to preserve meter, often, okay. um, uh, words will be put in different orders. Okay. And, um, yeah. Well, I know it's to preserve meter, but is that any particular technique to do that? Is that got a name for it? Or? Poetic inversion. Inver okay. Poetic inversion is, right. is, okay. is what it's called. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, while, while we are here, let's take a look at this, because you studied Shakespearean sonnets, and you haven't had an example yet. We had some uh, Italian sonnets, and we had a Spenserian sonnet, but we didn't have a Shakespearean sonnet. So, really quickly, while I have like 60 seconds, let's do the rhyme scheme. Got a pencil? Mines, A. Love, B. Finds, A. Remove is supposed to rhyme with love, B. So A, B, A, B. Then if it's a Shakespearean, the next, the mark should be C, right? Mark is C, shaken is D, bark is C, taken is C. Yep, okay. Cheeks is a new rhyme. What's, what's that gonna be? E, e. come, yeah. F, weeks, rhymes with cheeks, E, e. doom. Oh, yep. Rhymes with, it's supposed to rhyme with come. Yeah. yeah. And then proved and loved, the couplet. So you've got A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Okay, the rhyme scheme of, of a Shakespearean sonnet. And it is, um, it's in iambic pentameter. Uh, and so there you finally got a Shakespearean sonnet. And it's 7 o'clock. Okay, <laughs> now. We didn't get to, but don't forget. Well, you can't. Now bring this back because, because then we got Matthew Arnold. Totally different view of love. Now you can cheat and you can read this ahead of time. 
so you could be way ahead of me. But you're going to see a totally different worldview, a totally different, I mean, obviously, Shakespeare is, is writing from a Christian worldview in this. And, okay, we'll pray really quickly. Dear Lord, thank you for this class. Thank you so much for this class. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the men who try to um, promote your word through their writing. And thank you for those who miss, but we still have hope for them. Bless the food that we're about to eat tonight, and bless the hands that prepared it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Amen. See y'all.